weekend, Ghostbusters Afterlife, the latest film in the Ghostbusters franchise and a continuation of the original two films, debuts in theaters. So it seemed like the perfect time to go back and rewatch the original Ghostbusters and talk about it. Sean and I love to talk about movies and TV way too much. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comments section. Share your thoughts on the original 1984 classic, Ghostbusters. My take isn't the right take, it's just my take, and I would love to hear yours. Also, as this is a retro review of a movie that came out almost 40 years ago, this is a spoiler review. I will be talking about specifics, so if you haven't seen Ghostbusters, what are you doing watching this video? Go watch the original Ghostbusters, then come back, join the discussion, and I'd actually love to hear your take on the movie as someone that just watched it for the very first time after watching the intro to this video. Anyway, I'd love to talk about it. Join me down below. Point of reference, I'm born in 1981. That means I was the generation of kids raised on the real Ghostbusters cartoon. So... I don't remember a time when I first watched Ghostbusters. I don't remember when I first watched the cartoon. I just know Ghostbusters has just always been a part of my life. And it was so much of the popular culture of my childhood, kind of formative in my love for nerdy stuff, things like that. And... I have a certain bias towards the Ghostbusters franchise because in summer 2016, Ghost, but Lady Ghostbusters came out. My wife and I went to go see it on a whim. The internet had been going crazy about that film. One group of people was saying, if you love this movie, you're an idiot. The other half of the group was saying, if you don't love this movie, you're a sexist. We went to go see it just to go check it out. And the next day I was like, hey, I'll post a review about this movie on this thing that I'm going to start called Sean Chandler Talks About, and it turned it into an all-new career for me. Sean Chandler Talks About, my channel that last week hit 200,000 subscribers, started with Ghostbusters 2016. So, naturally, them announcing a new film that's in the original continuity from Ivan Reitman's son, Jason Reitman. All of it sounded great to me. So that's my history with Ghostbusters. It's just always been a big part of my life, and even a big part of my career. Let's get started talking about the good. And given that I started this review by calling it a classic, as you can probably imagine, I love the movie Ghostbusters. And I think it's one of those lightning in a bottle type movies that just managed to get pretty much everything right. At its core, it's a movie that it's a combination of kind of spooky ghost story with 80s Bill Murray comedy joined together and it just kind of works told with the plot line of a group of guys going into business story. That's the plot structure, but you get ghosts and you get lots of laughs and all the ingredients just happen to come together perfectly for this movie to just be highly entertaining, have a great memorable concept that just kind of pulls you in and it's, it's just fun and interesting, the idea of these group of guys that aren't action heroes becoming the Ghostbusters, and then it's just executed so well with the humor feeling so organic, the characters being likable without feeling overly written, and then it's just jam-packed with little memorable sequences all along the way. Now, when it comes to the comedy, part of what makes it work is that it's not written to be a comedy. It's just a funny movie because the characters are funny. Three of the Ghostbusters, they're, they're not really intentionally funny. They're not written to be funny guys. Sometimes they get some solid laughs because they're so clueless in their world of nerdy things that they just say things that are really funny because of how much it's detached from normal human experience. But the funny one in the group is just Vankman. Vankman, what happened? Are you okay? He slimed me. That's great! He, and he's not funny because he's doing all these big, elaborate joke setups. It's just because he's Bill Murray sarcastic. He just has an amusing personality. He's so playful. He so, seems so carefree about all the things going on all around him. He's so narcissistic as this 
kind of typical Bill Murray kind of character that's only likable because Bill Murray is funny. And all throughout the movie, he just has the perfect little Bill Murray zingers that feel like what some sarcastic dude in this situation would say. They don't feel like lines written by a screenwriter trying to do a great punchline setup. To contrast it with Ghostbuster, Lady Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters 2016, a movie that, that I don't hate. I'm not on the hate train for that one. Um, I certainly acknowledge its many issues, which I'm going into right now, but I don't, I don't hate it. But one of the big problems with the film is that it, it just feels like a bunch of people trying to be really funny. And so there's all these little bits about Chris Hemsworth being stupid and drawing a ghost with boobs. And there are all these sequences where they're like the ladies are just riffing and they're just going it like literally start dancing in the middle of the street. And there's like eight dance sequences in the movie. And it all just feels like them trying really hard to be funny, whereas Bill Murray is just effortlessly amusing and funny just being himself and reacting to all the crazy things happening. It feels like a real person, even though you're watching this totally fantastical story. Speaking of the fantastical side of things, part of also what makes the movie, I think, be so... have such broad appeal is that it's spooky without really being a horror movie. So my wife, you know, she's not into horror at all. My kid's too young, to, you know, I'm not gonna show them you know, <laughs> the Saw movies. But Ghostbusters, everybody loves something a little bit spooky, just a little bit scary. And so you have this movie that's one of these very easy entry points to getting into somewhat scary, somewhat spooky types of stories where you have ghosts that pop out and go, ah, at the screen a few times. You have the spooky moments. As we were watching it last week and the baby was in the room, the spooky music would happen. She goes, monster, monster. And she'd run and cover her head so the baby could pick up on the scary things happening. But at the same time, as long as you're not the baby, it's very accessible while having those elements inside of it at the exact same time. Other thing that's great about this movie, as someone who my formative years were the 80s, the 90s, that I just love the visual effects in this film, the old school practical way this, that they had to do things. And it just, I think it, it just adds a certain re, uh, reality to it. When you, you watch full CGI, they do so many things that are so cartoonish and so outlandish that, that it pulls you out of it, that you know you're watching a, a, an effect. And you know something didn't really happen, whereas where you have these practical sets and tables are really being flipped over and they're using old magician tricks to spin people around. You know you're seeing something real right there in front of you. You know It's happening there. And so even though obviously they didn't actually get ghost actors to perform and Slimer's not like a guy that's, you know, an, an out-of-work actor that's not that, but there's something real in the situations that grounds the special effect that you're seeing. And so I just love the old school effects that they did here. And even simple stuff, you watch the behind the scenes on how did they do the intro sequence where like the cards are just shooting out of a out of a the card catalog, which that's how libraries worked back in the 80s. If you're one of my younger viewers, they just had these cards in all these drawers. And so they literally just said they had like a straw and a guy going and would blow and the cards just shot out like that. And so you're watching something that's it's real. It's right there. It's actually happening. You don't know what's happening, but it's the same reason that you buy into a magic trick, that you're just astounded how they pulled that off. Whereas when you're watching CGI, there's a sense in which you just kind of, you know, you're watching a, a, a realistic cartoon on live action. And so I, I just, I just, I've always, because it's my formula, it's what I grew up with, have always seen the found practical things to be more believable and real than the, the visual effects and CGI and things like that. I also think part of the reason that this one works where some of the others didn't is what I mentioned before of it being a people going into business story where when you have the city slowly start being taken over by this paranormal force and then you have these nerdy guys that aren't action heroes but they have the scientific skill set to take advantage financially of this situation and some of them just want to make or one of them just wants to make money a couple of them are actual scientist people or two of them want to make money two of them are scientist people that join in on all this that it um 
like it creates a story where the journey of it feels natural and organic of demand for a product arises and so they're providing the service to our uh, the service, the product that's needed to take care of the ghosts. And so there's like a reason that some of this stuff takes place, why they come together at this point in time with the right things happening in light of the research they had been doing. And so the journey makes sense. And likewise, there'd be skeptics in that situation. The government would get involved, like, what on earth is going on here? But like having this subplot about the guy from Die Hard showing up to like investigate them as the environmental protection agent, like that feels like something a government bureaucrat would do. It It's a conflict that's organic, that's frustrating, that perfectly sets up Bill Murray to push back and kind of do his shtick and his deal like, well, why do you want to see the containment unit? Like, do all that stuff that he's so good at, you didn't say the magic word, just sets him up perfectly while also having a believable conflict that also... That what would the government do? Probably something stupid, just turn the thing off, that releases all the ghosts that they just f captured over the last however long has passed throughout the film, creating the third act being wild and crazy and setting up the scenario where the mayor would be like, yeah, I, I'm going to let these guys do their thing. Human sacrifice, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. As crazy as this seems, I'm going to let them do their thing. That's, it's just one of those scripts that they just got it right, had all the right conflicts, they cast the right people, and it just, that phrase, lightning in a bottle, everything came together to make a well-crafted, entertaining film that works on a bunch of different levels. All that makes sense as natural conflicts that would arise in light of guys battling ghosts out of nowhere that doesn't quite work so well when you get to the second one and everyone's like, what? There's no such thing as ghosts, even though all that crazy wild stuff happened five years ago. What? You guys are con men. Like, it just it seems like there's a bit of a gap in the logic in some of that where it just feels natural and organic here as the way the story flows. Likewise, there's a logic to why Sigourney Weaver is the one that kind of gets involved in all this because she's in the the apartment complex where all this is taking place. And so she just happens to be the person that's present where the evil is taking place. Whereas in the second one, it's just, just pure coincidence that once again, she gets sucked up into all of that. And it's, it's that better cohesive story that just makes this one stand out all above the rest. It's thought through. It's just unique and different of you try to think like, the idea of this mix of things with these guys, it doesn't seem like the obvious way to make a spooky comedy like this. You wouldn't think these ingredients, and that's almost why it works, that they went with something that was awesome rather than what seemed like the obvious thing of getting the most handsome leading men and things like that's not what they did at all. These are supposed to be nerds, so two of them just look like absolute nerds. And it just makes for this believable film with relatable characters while they're doing totally unrelatable things. It's funny. It's spooky. It just does everything right. All the ingredients come together perfectly with the way that it's paced, the, the score, the iconic song that... Obviously, everybody knows the song 37 years later. All these little pieces, just so iconic. In the execution, it just works. Like like coming up with the idea of like, what if there's this uh, marshmallow logo that starts marching through downtown New York? Something I loved from my childhood. Something that could never, ever possibly destroy us. Mr. Stay Puffed. Nice thinking, Ray. It's so weird, it's so stupid, it's so perfectly memorable. It's just one of those ideas that you go, yeah, that's that's just a fun idea. That's like a great thing, idea, way to do things. And you remember Slimer. In fact, Slimer, when he was on the, the cartoon, became so popular, he, they renamed the show Slimer and the Ghostbusters or something like that. It gave him his old segment because he was so popular because in the little details, 
the first ghost that they actually catch. They made him have like this personality and just was charismatic as like a goofy hot dog eating sliming ghost. And that's the magic of this film. It was a creative, interesting idea with the perfect guys taking over on it. Blending, comedy was spooky, just the right mix so it's highly accessible and just finding all the memorable little details. You know, they even get Rick Moranis as this side character that how do you take kind of the neighbor character that's kind of forgettable and make him interesting? You cast it Rick Moranis who just pops. He just stands out inside the movie and that this weird scenario is being chased by this demon that looks kind of like a dog that becomes kind of this running joke of like, oh, I got eaten by a dog or a dog attacked me and they saved me or turned into a dog. It's, it's just funny. It just finds that right bout. So anyway, Ghostbusters, one of those movies, I've always loved it. I think it's a classic. I've shown it to my kids. They love the Ghostbusters. And it's just it just has that quality to it of being timeless, being interesting, being highly entertaining without feeling like it's trying to force it. From there, let's move on to the bad. It's almost a perfect movie. Um, I think there's a, there are a couple times that I think it... It just throws in a couple raunchy jokes that just feel so far more raunchy than everything else in the movie that it stands out. So when you have a ghost giving Dan Aykroyd a, a blowjob, um, it just stands out in the movie. That Otherwise, it's like a nice entry point for my kids to watch the spooky thing, and then that happens. This seems like, okay, that's one joke. Clearly crossed the line of what the rest of the movie, it target audience that the rest of the movie is going for. And then in the third act, of course, the Marshmallow Man is pretty memorable, but when they're just kind of standing up there and like, are you a god and all that stuff, kind of anticlimactic. It just, you know, they're literally like standing there just like this, like answering questions, trying to clear their minds, like, oh, let's cross the streams. And, but they're just standing there, which is anticlimactic. That's it. That's all I got for you. Real quick, join me down below in the comment section. Let me know, what do you think about Ghostbusters? Do you love it? Are you younger and you're like, this thing is overrated? I know that's kind of where some people are at. They don't get the, the Ghostbusters love. Let me know if you're one of those people down below in the comment section. As for me, it's a near perfect movie, does everything right, and it stood the test of time. It takes a weird concept where it's nerdy 35 year old men becoming Ghostbusters and starting a business to do that. And it's still entertaining for me, 37 years later, and it's entertaining for my kids. That's the dream for filmmakers, to make a movie that stands the test of time. Overall, it's an A-plus on the entertainment scale. Let's go with that 10 out of 10. These, This is one of the great movies of all time. Of course you must watch if you haven't seen it. Go watch Ghostbusters. It's a classic. It's great. I love it. Uh, I don't remember if it's in my top 20 favorite movies of all time, but I'm going to do my top 40 favorite movies of all time in a couple weeks. It'll definitely be in there. So there you have it. Thank you guys so much for watching. Come back for my Ghostbusters Afterlife review and my Ghostbusters ranking. And hopefully I'll be able to review Ghostbusters 2 and Ghostbusters 2016 as well. And keep talking movies too much.